We are on AP Prep FRQ Topic 4, Data Questions. All of these questions will have a table of values in it uh, where we will get information that we need in the problem. Now, uh, some of the questions will also involve maybe a rate in, rate out, or area and volume, or differential equation to solve, things like that. Um, maybe series, you know, uh, but some of the information will have to be gained from looking at the and reading the table of values. So let's take a look at our most recent AP exams. And as you can see, this is another very common type of question. Some of them have a calculator, some of them do not. Um, so anyway, there wasn't one in 2019, but you can see that's a, it is a very popular type of question. So let's take a look at your, uh, your worksheet packet here. And I am looking at the 2016 number one. And since it's number one, this was with a calculator. So I'm gonna get my calculator handy and we'll be ready to go. So I'm starting to read this. It says water is pumped into a tank at a rate modeled by this. So all of a sudden, I'm thrown into my rate in, rate out situation. Only this time we have a table. So water is pumped into a tank modeled by W of T in liters per hour. It gives us our rate in. So that's our rate in. For time zero to eight, T is measured in hours. Okay, water is removed from the tank, so rate out at a rate rattled, modeled by R of T liters per hour, where R is differentiable and decreasing, we might need that information from zero to eight. So R is our rate out. So we will remember everything that we learned in our last little section on rate in and rate out for this. And then it says at time zero, there are 50,000 liters of water in the tank. So the amount, if I let A be the amount, at time zero is 50,000 liters, just liters. Okay, part A. Estimate R prime of two. Estimate R prime of two. Show the work that leads to your answer. Indicate units of measure. This is something that I tend to forget, so I'm gonna make a bubble around it so that hopefully I won't forget. So R prime at two. Well, I know R prime is the slope, the slope of the graph of R right at time equals two. So I notice here, time two is not one of my values for R. Even if it was, I would not use that exact value because we're supposed to estimate R prime at two. So we're estimating the slope of R at two. I'm gonna use the closest two time values, the closest two time values. Um, and I'm gonna use our old algebra one slope formula. Difference of the y's over difference of the x's. Y2 minus y1 over x2 minus y1. Um, or difference of the r's over difference of the t's, the closest two time values. So from time one to three. So change in r would be r at three minus r at one, and change in t will be three minus one. So we'll have 950 minus 1190 over three minus two. And I'm not gonna simplify that expression. That would be a safe stop, but I'm not gonna forget our units of measure. So our units of measure, here's my thought, here's my thought. I need units of R divided by units of T because it's delta R over delta T. So units of R over units of T. Units of R is liters per hour. Units of, units of T are in hours. So this will be units, I'm sorry, this will be liters per hour squared or you can say liters per hour per hour, and that's it. 
All right, that was worth two points. One point for the estimate, one point for the units. Okay, here's what you need to show. The minimum amount that you need to show is right here, right there. That's the minimum you have to show. You do not have to say this because it's the only thing we're doing in the problem. If we were asked to do several things, then yes, you have to label it. Otherwise, how will they tell which is which? But here, they only ask for one thing, so you don't have to say what you're finding. This is was just for you, just to see what you know, to remind you what we're doing. You don't have to say that, but you have to say this, and then you need to put your numbers in. Okay. All right. Part B. Use a left Riemann sum with four subintervals. So left Riemann sum, four subintervals indicated by the table to estimate the total total amount of water removed during the eight hours total amount of water removed over the eight hours. Well, I know the total amount of water removed will just be the integral. This is what we learned last time in uh, rate in, rate out. Um, from zero to eight of the rate of the water being removed, which is our R of T. So that is the total amount of water removed from the tank. Now we need to approximate this integral using a left Riemann sum. So let's remind ourselves how to do a left Riemann sum. A left Riemann sum, we're using rectangles for a left Riemann sum, and the first change in time will be 1 minus 0, or just 1. And then for the height of that rectangle, we're using the left hand height. So that first that first term in the left Riemann sum will be 1 or 1 minus 0. If you'd like to put 1 minus 0, go for it. You don't have to, though. Times the left height, the 1340. Okay. The next change in time will be 2. And then we're using the left hand height, the 1190. The next change in height will be uh, in time will be three, and the left height is the 950. And then the last change in, in time is two, and we're using the 740 for that height. We should get four terms in our left Riemann sum because they said to use four subintervals, and that's exactly what we got. Do not add these up. Don't use your cal I know this is a calculator active problem, but we have not used our calculator yet, and do not use it for this. There's no good that could be gained from that. All right. Do we need to give units here? Didn't ask me for units, so I'm not going to give units. If they had given units, if they had had asked for units, remember that R here. R is in liters per hour, so this is liters per hour times hours. Liters per hour times hours would be liters, so this the units here would be liters if they had asked for it. Okay. The second part of this question says, is this an overestimate or an underestimate of the total amount of water removed? So. Um, you may or may not recall us doing this, but I, we did spend a little time doing problems like this. And I go back up to the description of R in the problem. It says R is differentiable and decreasing. Focus on decreasing here. If R is decreasing, if R is decreasing, and we use a left Riemann sum, what is going to be happening? I usually come off to the side and I draw a little picture just for myself. If we have a decreasing function and I use a left Riemann sum, that means I'm using the left, left height of each rectangle, every rectangle is going to be above the curve. Every rectangle will be above the curve. 
So my estimate will be a, an overestimate of the actual uh, um, number of liters removed from this tank. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say it's an overestimate. The approximation is an overestimate. Since we used a left Riemann sum on a decreasing function. Three key things you need to say. Your answer, overestimate, left Riemann sum, decreasing function. I warned you back when we first learned this, and I'll remind you, do not get too wordy on this, okay? Do not start going on and on. Don't write a paragraph. This should be a very brief explanation, okay? Do not say, as you can see in the picture, our rectangles are going to be above the curve. Don't say things like that, all right? You can draw the picture just for yourself. Don't use the picture in your answer, okay? This is what you need to say if you want to get full credit. The way this problem was scored, this was worth, this part was worth three points. One point for the left Riemann sum. One point for the estimate. And one point for the overestimate with reason. So the left Riemann sum is right here. Um, the estimate is also right here. We just didn't simplify it. We say stopped. So that satisfies these two points and then our overestimate with reason. Alrighty, part C. Use your answer from part B to find an estimate of the total amount of water in the tank to the nearest liter at the end of eight hours. Okay, so think back to your rate in, rate out. Now we're dealing with total amount of water in the tank. So here's where I'm going to say let A of T be the amount of water in the tank at time T. Okay, then I know. A prime is rate in minus rate out. Our rate in was W of T, which we have not used up until now in this problem, minus our rate out, and our rate out was our R of T. Okay? So if we want the total amount of water in the tank, I know we're starting at 50,000. We just need to find A at 8. So I'm going to set up fundamental theorem. A at time 8 minus A at time 0 is the integral from 0 to 8 of A prime. Right? Fundamental theorem. Now, A prime is W minus R. So I'm going to write that in. W of T minus R of T. And I know I'm going to need to split that up because W and R are given to me in two different formats. W is an equation. I have the expression for W and I have a table for R. So I know I got to split this integral up into two, two, into two piece, pieces. Ugh. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so we have got A of 0 is 50,000. This I can use my calculator for because I have the equation for that. This I just approximated up here, right? 
So this is a point where um, I think I have a choice here. I'm going to need to pull this amount down here. I could put that into my calculator and get a number for that. Could do that. Or I could say equals, I could set this equal to some variable. Maybe, um, oh, I don't know, maybe x something. And then I can use x down here for that. Okay. If I do that, I'm going to change this to approximately equal to because this was an approx this x is an approximation for this integral right here. And in my calculator, I'm going to get the other function going. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in for y1 just in case I need it for part d. So 2,000, I, I expect to because we've only used this once e to the negative t squared divided by 20. I check and make sure I put that in correctly, and I think I did. So now I need math 9, 0 to 8 of my y1. So I get, um, I get 7, 8, 3, 6. 0.195325. I'm just going to give them a bunch of decimals, just because I, I'm, I, I haven't, I don't have my final answer yet. And then this would be minus x if I called that x up there. Or I could go ahead and add this in my calculator, but I'm just trying to show you how things could be done. So a of 8 would be 50,000 plus this 7836.195325 uh, minus x. They did not ask me for units, so I don't need to give them units. Okay? All right. This was scored at two points. One point for the integral. One point for the answer. So one point for that integral, one point for the answer. All right, part D. Um, between 0 and 8 um, hours, is there a time t when the rate at which the water is pumped into the tank is the same as the rate at which water is removed from the tank? Explain why or why not. Hmm. Part D oftentimes is a little tricky little part. Sometimes it's not. So don't just assume you can't do Part D. But uh, sometimes it's, it is tricky. So we want for W to be the same as R. Is there a time when W is the same as R? Okay. Now I could, I have, I have W stored into my calculator. And I could graph it for 0 to um, 8. And I have a, I know that R goes from 1340 to 700, right? So I could put Y min as 700 and Y max as 1340 and C. Um, see what's happening. So there's the curve. And the question is, is there a time at which R is equal to W here? Okay. Well, it's possible. It's possible because there, 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 are, W's, there are W's here between 0 and 8. So it's possible. Um, let's Let's think about this. So we want W to equal R. We want W to equal R. Well, I'm trying to think of how we can do that. So this sounds like one of our like um, intermediate value theorem problems. That's what it sounds like to me. Whenever we want for a, a function to equal something, 
Um, sometimes that's an intermediate value theorem. So I'm trying to think of how we could apply the intermediate value theorem. What if, what if we said, if this is true, then that means that W minus R is zero, right? What if we said, okay, at time, at time eight, at time eight, what is W of eight minus R of eight? Well, W of eight, go to my home screen, W of eight, is 81.524. R of 8 up from the table is 700. So if I subtract 700 from that, I get negative 618.476. Okay? What about at time 0? At time 0, W of 0 minus R of 0 is, well, W at 0 is 2,000. R of 0 is 1140. I'm sorry, 1340. So, so now I see how we can do this. So this difference at time 8 is negative. This distance at time 0 is positive. So there must be a time when the difference is 0. Since, now it, there wouldn't have to be if these two were not both continuous. We need for these two both to be continuous. So let's let's see why they're continuous. First of all, W is continuous because we know that this is a continuous function. R is continuous because they gave us that it is differentiable, therefore it must be continuous. We need to say that W is a continuous function. R is given to be differentiable. Therefore, R must be continuous. Therefore, W minus R is continuous. If W and R are both continuous, then its difference, their, their difference, must be continuous. By the intermediate value theorem, then, so there must exist. I'm going to use my little there must exist symbol, but you can write out there must exist sometime between 0 and 8, such that, I'm using my such that symbol, but you can write out such that, such that W of t is equal to R of t. There may have been a different way to do that. I'm sure that there was a different way to do that, maybe a shorter way to do that, but this is the way that I saw to do it. This part was worth two points, one point for considers W of t minus R of t. That makes me think that we were not weird in this way we answered it. And part uh, one point for the answer with explanation. All right. So that was 2016. I did that specifically for our first problem because it was a rate in, rate out, and I wanted to reinforce what we did last time with our rate in, rate out. Now I'd like to go to number 18. Okay, not number 18, the problem from 2018. 
This was number four, no calculator, so I'm sliding my calculator off to the side. So as you see, it has a little table of values. This may look familiar to you. As a matter of fact, um, part of this question was on our very first worksheet, one, our, our unit one worksheet packet. Um, part of this was in here. So we have been kind of goofing off with this problem off and on at moments throughout the year. The height of a tree is given by a twice differentiable function h, where h is me measured in meters and t is measured in years. Select the values of h given in the table. Use the, table in, uh, use the data in the table to estimate h prime of 6. Using correct units, interpret the meaning of h prime of 6 in the, con in the context of the problem. Very typical little part here, very common. So h prime of 6, we know, is the slope of h at time 6. At time 6, the slope of h. So we use the surrounding two points. So we will have change in height over change in time from time 5 to 7. OK, so our old Algebra 1 slope. So change in height h of 7 minus h of 5 over 7 minus 5. h of 7 is 11. h of 5 is 6. It did not say to give units for this. It said to use correct units in our inter interpretation, and I will. But I'm going to pause there because I'm done with that little piece. Okay. Now we're going to interpret the meaning of h prime of 6. So, the, by the way, the units would have been units of h divided by units of t. So meters divided by years, meters per year. So that's a rate, right? So I'm going to say at 6 years, I, I always begin with my time. Well, I don't always, but I try to always <laughs> begin with my time. You should too. That will help you remember to do it. So at six years, the tree um, is growing, and I made sure that it is indeed growing. The tree is growing at a rate of h prime of six meters per year. Okay, what you need to say, you need to say the time and the time and the units of time. You have to. Every time. Every time you're interpreting meaning. Give the time and the and the units for time. Okay? Or give the unit um, you need that unit. And then you need the meaning and then the units of your answer. Has to be two sets of units and the meaning and the time, all of it. Okay, this was worth two points, one for the estimation, one for the interpretation with units. No units, no point at all, never. Okay, what you have to show up here, you have to show this right here. You do not have to say that. However, I definitely did say that so that I could use it down here. Okay. All right, part B. Explain why there must be at least one time in between 2 and 10 such that h prime is 2. This is an existence question. Explain why there must exist. So this is either an IVT or an MVT. That's what my thought is. And I know that it's an MVT, mean value theorem, because of the prime. Our data is an H. They're asking me about H prime, so I know I need to use the mean value theorem. For the mean value theorem, we must say that the function is continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval. 
of whatever times we need. We have to say that, okay? So I'm going to start there. I usually do start there. That's usually my first step and my three steps that, of this um, explanation. Um, it doesn't have to be the first. It could be the second, but it has to be either first or second. I usually go ahead and get it out of the way here. So my question is, why, why must H be continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval? Why must it be? So H is given to be twice differentiable. That means that it's differentiable and continuous everywhere not just on the exact intervals, but everywhere. So that's exactly what I'm going to say. H is given to be twice differentiable therefore H is both continuous and differentiable. You must say that. To get credit for using the MVT, you must, you, must, you must state why H is continuous and differentiable. Okay? Next up, I need to find, I need to find times that make H, my H prime, my H prime approximation two. I need to find two times where that's true. Okay? So, Let's come up to our table. I always start with the times that they give me and try that. So I want for my change in H over change in T to be 2. So if I do that, my change in T will be 8. That would be my denominator. My change in H would be 13.5. That is not 2. So that doesn't work. So the two times that they gave me did not work. That just means I need to go inside and find two more. So I'm looking for a change in H to be twice that of a change in T. So this distance, this difference right here would be 9. 9 over 4 is not 2. This distance is 5. 5 over 2 is not 2. This is 4. 4 and 2 there. I just found it. So this distance here is 4, this distance here is 2, 4 over 2 is 2. So I'm going to be using time 3 and 5. So I'm going to say h at 5 minus h at 3 over 5 minus 3 is 6 minus 2 over 5 minus 3, which is 2. Therefore, therefore, there must exist some time in 3 to 5, which is in 2 to 10. I say that only because that's exactly what they told me to do, such that h prime of t is equal to 2. Again, if you don't wish to use these symbols, you don't have to. Okay? These were the ones where you could come up and say, just repeat this. There must be at least one time for which such, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay? This was worth two points. Two points. The first point was for h of 5 minus h of 3 over 5 minus 3 is equal to 2. And the second point was for the conclusion using the mean value theorem. You do not have to state mean value theorem in your conclusion, but using mean value theorem means you would not have gotten this point if you had not stated this up here, because that's part of the mean value theorem. Okay? Part C. Use a trapezoidal sum, trapezoidal sum with four subintervals, indicated by the data in the table, to approximate the average height of the tree over the time interval. This common mistake is for kids just to throw down the trapezoidal sum, 
or throw down the, uh, the Raymon sum or whatever without thinking about what it means. The Riemann sum, trapezoidal sum, is always an approximation for just the integral. That's just the integral. Average height is not just an integral. It has a coefficient out in front of the integral, right? I'm pulling out my average value of a function theorem out of our toolbox. Average value of a function is 1 over b minus a, integral a to b of our function. Oops. Oops. Okay. That's the average value of a function. So my average height of the tree from 2 to 10 would be 1 over 10 minus 2 integral 2 to 10 of our height function. Okay. So this is equal to 1 over 8 times now I'm going to put my Riemann sum. Now since I'm doing a Riemann sum, I'm going to change my equal to to an approximately equal to. And here comes my trapezoid, not Riemann, trapezoidal sum. So trapezoidal sum, let's remind ourselves on trapezoidal sum, we have one half, the this will be the change in time, or the change in the base length here, times the height one plus height two for each of the four subintervals. Now, I'm starting at time 2, and I'm going to time 10. So I'm starting at time 2, going to time 10. That is going to cover everything. So the first, so I'm going to have here 1 half. Okay. The first change in time is 1. And then the sum of those heights is 1.5 plus 2. Do not actually add those. Just write them down. Next, because AP has to see those values. They have to see how you're doing the trapezoidal sum. If you don't write those down, you, um, you won't get credit for that trapezoidal sum point. Okay. The next change in time is 2. Sum of the heights, 2 plus 6. The next change in height in time is 2. Some of the heights, 6 and 11. And then the last change in time is 3, 11, and 15. Okay. And they did not ask for units. That's just our answer. Don't. Um, this is a no calculator problem, but I'm certainly not going to start adding these. Okay. This was worth two points. One point for the trapezoidal sum. One point for the approximation. Oops. Okay. Um, one quick thing. I remember this was this was the part of the question that was on. Uh, I think it was on our first test, or there was one just like this on our very first test. Kids tend to for, don't they tend not to write that one eighth there. That one eighth is part of this approximation. Without that one eighth, you're not getting the average height of the tree. Okay, you're getting something else. So you need that one eighth there. All right, part D. The height of the tree in meters can also be modeled by g. So now we have another way to model the height of the tree. So this is another way for height of the tree. Instead of h, now we're using g. x is the diameter of the base of the tree in meters. When the tree is 50 meters tall, the diameter of the base of the tree is increasing at a rate. So this is x. x is increasing at a rate of 0.3 meters per year. So they're giving me dx dt wh um, when the tree is 50 meters tall. So when g is 50, that's the height, is 0.03 meters per year. According to this model, what is the rate of change of the height of the tree with respect to time in meters per year?
at the time when the tree is 50 meters tall. So we're looking for dg dt when the tree is 50 meters tall. So all of a sudden we have a related rates question. Do not be afraid of related rates questions. They're really not too bad. We have a function for g, and they wrote g of x. I'm going to leave off the of x. Just write g. So g is equal to 100x over 1 plus x. I left a little space because I know I need to take the derivative of both sides with respect to t, which is what we do in related rates questions. We have our equation. We just take the derivative of both sides with respect to t. It's not bad. On the left, we have dg dt. On the right, I'm going to first take the derivative with respect to x and then multiply by dx dt. It's not bad. It's what we do. Take the derivative with respect to x, multiply by dx dt. A little implicit differentiation, a little chain rule. This, all it is is chain rule. So the derivative, we're using the quotient rule. So the derivative of the top is 100 times the bottom minus the derivative of the bottom times the top, all divided by the bottom squared, quotient rule. And then we multiply that by dx dt. Okay? We're looking for dg dt when g is 50, and we know dx dt at that value of g is 0 0.03. So I know what to put in for dx dt. My question is, what do I put in for x? Well, to find out what we put in for x, I need to come off to the side and do a little work. So when g is 50, I'm ha this is my equation for g. When g is 50, I can solve this for x without too much trouble. Multiply both sides by 1 plus x. Subtract 50x, divide by 50, and we get a nice, neat little x is 1. So when g equals 50 and x equals 1, I'm, I'm going to have dg dt is equal to 100 times 2 minus 100 divided by 2 squared times 0.03. Safe stop. I'm looking to see if they asked me for units. They did not. In fact, they gave me units. They gave me that the units were meters per year, so I certainly don't need to say anything more about it. Um, this was worth a total of three points. Two points for the derivative of g of x. So that would be this right here, the derivative with respect to t of g of x, and one point for um, the answer. And then they had a little note. Um, they said a maximum of one out of the three points can be earned if you don't use the chain rule, meaning if you don't put dx dt, you only can get a maximum of one point out of those three points. That's how important they think that is. Okay? All right. Um, that's probably all we'll have time for in the classroom. But on the video here, I am going to do one more with you. I think I'm going to come and do the problem from 2012. From 2012. So, um, If this video has gotten too long for you, you're welcome to um, just do this on your own and come back and watch the video if you run into trouble. But the one from 2012 is with a calculator. It was number one, so with a calculator. Uh, the temperature of water in a bathtub is modeled by a strictly increasing twice differentiable. Think about how, how we might be able to use that. 
function w, where w is measured in degrees Fahrenheit, t is measured in minutes. At time zero, the temperature is 55 degrees. I'm really not sure why they said that, because they also gave us the exact information right here. Right? Yeah. So I don't know why they specified that, but they did. Okay. The water is heated for 30 minutes, beginning at time zero. Values of W of T is given. Okay. All right. So use the data in the table to approximate W prime at 12. I certainly hope by this point we were able to do that. So this is approximately equal to W at 15, I go to my surrounding time values, minus W at 9 over 15 minus 9, okay, which is 67.9 minus 61.8 divided by 15 minus 9. They did not ask me to give units for that, okay. Um, they did say to use units for the interpretation. So I'm not going to give units for that, but I am definitely going to give units for my interpretation. At time 12 minutes, the temperature is changing. at a rate of W prime at 12, and I have to give units. What will my units be? My units would be units of W divided by units of T. So degrees per minute. This was worth two points. One point for the estimate, one point for the interpretation, with units. Okay, part B. Use the data in the table to evaluate, evaluate, not approximate, evaluate the integral of W prime. Well, when I see the integral of W prime, I know that's fundamental theorem. Right there is fundamental theorem. The first, the easy, the easy one. So the integral from 0 to 20 of w prime of t dt is equal to w at 20 minus w at 0. That's just fundamental theorem, which is, I have to say what it is, even though it's given in the table, you have to grab those numbers, 71.0 minus 55.0. Okay. They did not ask me for units for that, but again, I need to interpret. So what does this mean? What does this mean? Well, what is W of 0 minus W, I'm sorry, W at 20 minus w, w at 0? That's the change in temperature. That is the change in temperature from, from 0 minutes to 20 minutes, right? So um, this integral gives the change in temperature, I have to give units, in degrees Fahrenheit from 0 to 20 minutes. You always, always, always have to give time, okay? And then you need to say the meaning and give units for the meaning of whatever it is you're interpreting. This was worth two points. One point for the value, one point for the interpretation with units. Part C. For time 0 to 20, the average temperature of the water is given by this. Use a left Riemann sum with four subintervals to approximate the value. And then we have to say if it's an overestimate or an underestimate with explanation. So there's a couple things going on here. So first of all,
the left Riemann sum. So this will give an approximation. We are not going to forget our 1 over 20. Do not forget to bring that over because the left Riemann sum is only going to approximate the integral part. So from 0 to 20, left Riemann sum, change in time is 4, use the left height, 55.0. Change in time is 5, the height is 57.1, the left height. The next change in time is 6. Change in height is 61.8. The last change in time is 5, and the height is 67.9. So I know that that is going to get me, just that is going to get me two points. I know it will, because um, I always give a point for the just the Riemann sum and then a point for the approximation. Okay, now for the overestimate or underestimate, um, we are given that d um, W is strictly increasing. W is strictly increasing and we used a left Riemann sum, so every rectangle is going to be below the curve. Every rectangle will be below the curve, so our estimate is an underestimate of the actual value, the average um, temperature. So our estimate is an underestimate since we used a left Riemann sum on an increasing function. This part was worth three points. One point for the left Riemann sum. One point for the approximation. That would include this 1 over 20, which we did not forget. <laughs> and one point for the um, underestimate with reason. Again, do not get worried with when you're writing that reason. Okay, part D. For time 20 to 25, all right, so now we're at a time beyond what they gave us in the table. For time 20 to 25, the function W that models the water temperature has a first derivative given by this. Oh, okay. Based on the model, what is the temperature of the water at time 25? Ah, now I'm kind of understanding why they stressed this in the prob in the description, because they're giving us W at zero. Now they gave it to us here too. It, they're also giving us W at 20, and actually we we I still don't know why they gave us that. I take that back. I don't know why they stressed that. But they did give us this in the table. They gave us W at 20. They're asking us for W at 25, right? They're asking us for the temperature of the water at time 25, so they're asking us for W at 25. They gave us W at 20, and they gave us W prime for 20 to 25 minutes. So I can use fundamental theorem. So, so far in this problem, this whole problem was a calculator problem, and I never have touched my calculator the whole time. I will now, though. So, I'm looking for W25. This is going to equal 71 plus that integral. And for the first time in the problem, and right before the end of the problem, I'm grabbing my calculator. It's not uncommon. So 71.0 plus math 9, zero, uh, 20 to 25 of W prime, so I'm going to be very careful typing that in, 0.4 square root T cosine 0.06 
dt, close parentheses, dt, where x is t. I'm looking at that to make sure that everything is correct. I think it is. So 73.043. Okay, this was worth two points. One point for the integral, one point for the answer. So this was a situation where part D was not bad at all. I mean, quite seriously, this whole problem I thought was really very reasonable. This would be one of those problems that I think would give kids some confidence to go on with the rest of the FRQs. So. Um, they certainly can be this way. They're, not every FRQ is seemingly impossible. <laughs> okay, that's it. Now you guys go and try your hand at some of these.